but that's the only procedural note. Um, otherwise, I am very happy now uh, to introduce Richard Palmer, um, who will then introduce uh, the subsequent panel um, for our first uh, or our first topic uh, after the break about integrating RTI uh, and related techniques into AAAF. And just a quick note that uh, Serena Piccarelli, um, who was meant to participate, um, couldn't be here today. But uh, otherwise, um, Richard will introduce the rest of the folks, and we'll get started with RTI. I'm going to go through some of the technical issues with uh, uh, integrating RCI into the IIIF that we're aware of, and we're going to have uh, a bit of a roadmap on how we might then do that um, for becoming a community group um, in IIIF. And then we're going to have a bit of a discussion, and if you have any really, really complicated technical questions, then uh, Vincent and Mark are going to answer them. And that's what we're going to do for the room of this room. Hi, everybody. So... Uh, RTI stands from Refractance Transformation Imaging and it means basically that you have an image and you can change the light direction and get a different lighting of the same object. As you can see, this is uh, an example of what you can see and uh, other than uh, changing the light direction, you can do other things like uh, uh, removing the colors, uh, looking at the geometry and do other operation that uh, works on uh, when the on, on look uh, and geometry of the object. So how do you create such an image that you can relight? You have to take a bunch of pictures, around 50, 100 or something, uh, from the same point of view. The best way to do this is to have a dome, which is on the left, is a collection of fixed LEDs that you turn one at a time and take a picture. This can be automated and it can be very fast and reliable. Then you have some mathematical transformation. There are different mo mathematical models for obtaining the same uh, uh, effect. And uh, the techniques range spans from the 2002, I think, uh, which 20 years ago was invented this technology. And then you save the results, and the results usually are stored as a set of images. So to, to speak about uh, the, the, um, the models, there are different mathematical models allows you to relight the image. The first inventor was the polynomial texture mapping. Uh, then there was different basis like uh, the uh, 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 hemispherical harmonics and radial basis function that has different characteristics in how they are able to represent the illumination. And you can see, for example, the original photo on the top left, which has a pretty strong reflection. But if you use a polynomial texture map, you get uh, very little reflection is the second one. So it's not very good at representing refraction. The harmonical spherics do such a, a little bit of a better job, but you can do, if you want reflection, maybe there are other techniques. On the other hand, the first two are more robust, so they have different characteristics. But they have uh, uh, a lot of things in common. Uh, all of them are able to, to separate uh, the geometry from the color, and that's the most important thing that you can do. So you can see a fossil, you can remove the color of the rock and, and, and look only at the geometry of the object or do the, the reverse and try to look only at the material without looking at the effect of shade on ref and reflections. You can get normal maps that can be used for rendering. And uh, all of them more or less adopt the same data structure, which is uh, the there is a mathematical model that requires some coefficients. 
uh, they are numbers. And uh, usually you would store them in a floating point uh, and uh, you, you need uh, a, a set of floating point for each pixel of the image. But it's not a very convenient way to transmit this data and store this data, so we usually encode them as images. And uh, so they, they require some quantization and uh, some scaling and other parameters, but in the end you can save as JPEGs or other formats. And so they, they, become, uh, they can be compressed and sent over the web. And uh, on apart from the images, you also need some information about the mathematical model you have used. So first, which mathematical model you have used, and then uh, parameters, because all of these mathematical models have some parameters, for example, the number of planes uh, you might have uh, to encode in three images, six, nine, or even more images. And, uh, and this is a for an example of some one of the formats where you can have a JSON with some parameters, and the viewer from this parameter is able to re, uh, re rebuild the mathematical model and play it uh, on, uh, on the graphic card. Uh, all of them are reasonably pretty fast and low requirements, so you can render on any device, more or less. What are the main use of the RTI? I found mostly four categories. The first one is to reproduce the appearance of, of an object. You have a shiny object uh, with interesting reflection and phenomena that you want to display, and a single photo is not able to capture it. So if you create an RTI uh, and a viewer, you can uh, show the, the full glory of the object uh, in, uh, on the web or, for, or in a local display. The second uh, type of uh, application is using for the tail. These uh, objects have uh, usually you can have a very high resolution, a very controlled photographic setting where the, the, the moving the lights can highlight uh, very small and fine detail that could be pretty hard to get in a single photo. This mimics what happens uh, in what are archaeological uh, archaeologists doing with the raking light where you move your light to get the, the, the fine detail of the object and you can mimic it uh, uh, even remotely, so which is another interesting application is that you can do it remotely, otherwise m complicated materials and small objects would be very difficult to do on the web with a single photo. Another thing that you can do is measurement, so since you can get a sort of 3D, uh, provided you can do some good calibration of the setting, you can get measurement on eights uh, and uh, shape of the, of uh, for example, an, inc uh, an incision on a stone, you can try to guess if the incision is rectangular or pointy, you can get metric measurement on the object. And finally, it can be used for documentation because it captures a lot of the object and you can, for example, monitor state changes in time or monitor a restoration and say what changes in terms of colors and uh, uh, geometry. Here are some of the, there are many examples of this technology. For example, this is a, a uh, an exhibition where in a museum there is a coin collection, but the coins are very small behind the glass. You can't really see them well, especially if maybe someone has some sight impairment. And we made, made a big screen with an RTI where you have all the coins that are on display just behind you, and you can change the light, see how shiny they are, and look in details at the craftsmanship of the coins, and maybe so, uh, get the occasion to convey some information. An example of the tail is when you have a stone that is difficult to read because, for example, the grain of the stone is very heavy. The granite has a lot of detail and makes it difficult to read the inscription. And using RTI, you can extract a very clear representation of what was the inscription. And as one of the first uses of the RTI was on uh, tablet uh, with cuneiform uh, inscription because for the same reason, uh, there are fine detail and you want an image where you can change the light to really see how the, inci uh, the incision is done. Measurement uh, can be used, uh, for example, to segment the material, so you can get an object and say, this is one kind of material, this is another. Uh, you can measure the depth uh, of, of the scraping and stuff like that. And finally, you can make some documentation when you take an RTI before a restoration, after the restoration, and you can see how the geometry of the coin, where you remove the green and stuff like that. 
So these are the main four uses of this technology. Uh, we are not going too much into detail, but basically the main advantage of this technique is that this very low entry barrier. You need the camera and the light at, at minimum, and you can already start producing something. You may want to move on something, a, and can be automated if you have a dome and some uh, good calibration, it's just pressing a button. So this is the main advantage of this thing. And uh, it's also good for complex material, because if you're trying to do a 3D scanning of materials which are shiny and reflective, it gets complicated. This, uh, this method is more, ro more robust with this kind of uh, object. As a, as a negative, uh, well negative, some limitation is that you have a fixed viewpoint. So you're looking only at one direction. If you have a reasonably fat object, this is not a big limitation. If you have complicated objects, maybe statues, stuff like that, there are a lot of limitation coming from the fact that you have only a viewpoint. Uh, also calibration can be an issue because it's not exactly simple to get into uh, if you want some measurement and stuff like that. Uh, about the software, there is a lit, uh, well, probably the biggest problem with this uh, technology is that it's sparsely supported. It's not widespread support. There are only a, a few groups which are writing software. I'm one of the volunteer, Hendrik is another one, that are providing support for creating and viewing these objects. It's a, a little bit in development, and probably the biggest thing that kept this thing behind the in development is the lack of standards, because there is no widespread standard for this technology. Uh, a little bit uh, was emerged uh, 20 years ago when, the when this technology evolved. There was some basic support in terms of a single builder that could build RTI and uh, a viewer on your PC. Uh, web, uh, web support came much later and not in and this format that were de developed at the time were not exactly web friendly. On the contrary, were horrible to send over the web. So right, everybody developed his own solution. But the fundamentals are the same, basically, image and metadata. And since it's images and they get sent over the web, it makes sense that it gets standardized in this setting because we already have a lot of things of, uh, of for sending, annotating, and uh, working with these images that are, that requires only a, st a standardization effort to make it easy to, uh, for someone to implement in their viewers. Okay. So uh, that leads on to our ne next question. Um, could he ask who has ever used RTI or RTI applications in a project? And who sees RTI as something meaningful for integration to IIIS? Okay, well that's good. We'll carry on with the talk then. <laughs> uh, so I think we're going to do a few case studies now. I think Andy, you're next. Up. So myself and my colleague Richard Allen are going to go into, or mostly Richard is going to go into much more detail uh, on this project this afternoon. But I will just briefly uh, kind of show what our project was looking at, and that is a very high resolution surface scanning of various artifacts that we hold at the Bodleian Libraries. And uh, this is a beautiful painted page uh, from a 17th century album uh, from the Mughal Empire, and it's one of a lot of, I mean, we've made hundreds of recordings at this point, um, but this one looks quite cool. Um, and one of the things that you can see here is you know, the, the surface indentation uh, that's been made, the kind of dent um, and so on yeah, in the material. Um, I just want to kind of reiterate what Federico was saying, the kind of conservation aspect is, is extremely uh, uh, interesting. Uh, and so this is just kind of one of the examples of sort of the, the thing that we have captured um, by removing the color. Um, and if you kind of zoom in on the dude's face here, uh, it not only shows the individual layers of paint which have been applied, but also hundreds of pricked holes which you can't see at all in the color image. So in some ways, very similar to kind of multispectral imaging in that it's things you can't see with the naked eye, but things that are you know, extremely uh, relevant to researchers in you know, each particular field. Uh, and so we, uh, this is a kind of the example of the different kind of uh, composite views that we end up with. So uh, an albedo, kind of a, a composite image that we kind of created as a, a default view of the object, um, the various normal or diff maps. Um, and we were looking for ways that we thought it would be most appropriate to kind of display this information. Because uh, as, as we've discussed, we've uh, 
we'd like to make it available uh, via triple IF. Uh, and there is an established pattern, uh, obviously, uh, like for multispectral imaging, where we can use a, a choice uh, to display different images on a canvas uh, because you know, it is indeed different views of the same image. Um, and we thought this was exactly the same class of problem. Um, and so it's obviously very easy for us to provide a, a manifest that has a, a choice of images on it. Uh, Mirador uh, indeed comes with a, a plugin these days that lets you kind of blend between um, layers, which gives you a kind of approximation of being able to recolor the, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the color removed version, etc., and blend between them. Uh, but we went into a bit more detail where we thought it would be more make more sense to provide a tiny extension for IIIF to describe the type of nap um, that we will be using. Um, and so really minimal uh, extension that we can just add on uh, and say that this particular uh, image is a type of albedo or this one is a, a diff map or a normal map, etc. Uh, and that means that uh, a client, and in our case our plugin, which again we'll demonstrate this afternoon, uh, can take advantage of that and kind of render those in a, in a more interesting way, allowing us to kind of move the light around in the browser, etc. I'll hand over to Richard. So our interest at the V&A is in relation to the Donatello exhibition that's on at the moment. Um, as you can see pictured here, the Donatello's Ascension is one of the objects at the V&A um, that's featuring in the exhibition. And it is uh, carved using squashed relief. And apologies, I'm assuming that I can't pronounce the Italian for that, so I'm going to stick with the English. And it's really hard to photograph. Um, as you can see in a book, a uh, uh, chapter in a book that our publish head of publishing wrote about the problem of imaging this uh, sculpture, because it's so shallow, the relief, uh, that it's really hard to take a good picture of it. So when we suggested this technique, uh, they were very happy. After some discussions with the conservation department about uh, take it down from the wall and taking a picture, and with much assistance from Federico and using the open line technology from CNR, we um, released on the website this viewer. I'm not brave enough to do a live demo, so I'm just putting screenshots. But uh, this is really good for us. But now we want to do lots more. And that's where we need IIIF to come in because we can't just keep doing one-offs. Oh, I know. Uh, some other teasers to show what the technology could do when we would start working towards uh, an, uh, an integration in uh, IIIF. Um, I'm very glad I could show you this example. It's one of the masterpieces which has been uh, made here in the vicinity of uh, Naples. Uh, the Bible of Anjou. It's also a typical example of it has been made in this vicinity, this manuscript, but today it is at A. Leuven Libraries, which is my home uh, institution. And we did like so many institutions have done over the course of the last 20 years, the 20 years of digitization. Uh, we have uh, photographed that manuscript according to very specific uh, guidelines. We follow uh, in, the, in the old days, we followed uh, the metamorphose guidelines. Now we're mostly following the uh, Haji guidelines. And one of the big issues, and if we would start making the count here of how many people over here are on those kind of collections and have already digitized that kind of uh, content, uh, it could be probably millions of pieces uh, if we make the count. And one of the issues we have with that is actually that the materiality of your material you have been imaging using these standardized photographic uh, approaches, it, most of it gets lost. Yeah? You would get a kind of a flat image of what actually is, if you zoom in, a very three-dimensional uh, surface as well, although in documentary heritage it is in a flat uh, plane. Yeah? And so you can see at the uh, right-hand side, uh, we also made uh, RTI, RTI-alike uh, images uh, of the same spots which have also been imaged with uh, standard photography. And then, of course, you see that layered situation and that there is a lot of information uh, in there. Uh, an extra trigger here is what uh, uh, Federico also already mentioned. Uh, if you make sure you have the right metadata in those kind of uh, files, in those kind of data sets, there is also metric information uh, in there, uh, which, of course, uh, allows you to do enormously detailed measurements on a surface which if I would ask a conservator uh, or a keeper, can I, can I really do the measurements on the original, 
that person will immediately say, do not touch this illumination, obviously. But then, of course, once you have these kind of technologies, you have very detailed, very correct uh, information. And if both of them, like in Mirador, we can combine uh, images coming from all kind of collections next to each other, that we could also include RTI images, that would be an enormous uh, added uh, value. And then with the same kind of technology, uh, we, is that, yeah, we also imaged it with multispectral imaging. So we just uh, saw that Andy kind of mentioned uh, you can, it's already possible, of course, and many of you have already seen examples to have in registered layers in, uh, in Mirador, for example. Uh, that is not a problem. That is a known uh, application which is already present and have been used already by many uh, groups around the world. Uh, well, RTI can also be combined with multispectral imaging. And here you see an example of a recording and then how the results, how it has been used, for example, to go even deeper into the research with this type of uh, data sets. For example, we use it for the identification of uh, pigments very specifically on one of the details in this uh, manuscript in the Bible of uh, Anjou. Huh? So there are a lot of possibilities uh, with this system. What Serena was going to uh, show is, uh, is this example, for example. She's doing her PhD very specifically, even further on, not only on the Bible of Anjou, but also on other manuscripts which have been made by the same um, uh, creator. And uh, she's looking very specifically at production marks, but some of these production marks, as in this case, which is based on standard photography, they are still visible, but sometimes they have been scratched away. This leaves very, very extreme, extreme shallow uh, remnants, which standard photography and even very good raking photography might quite often miss. And again, if we would be able to integrate RTI in uh, uh, IIIF, it would be amazing, of course, that we have those two kind of images next to each other, that you can see how it visually looks for the human eye, but at the same time, we can also go deeper into uh, the object uh, as such. Uh, these are some extra triggers to make sure if we ask again that more and more hands are rising, that this is really something interesting uh, to work on. Nonetheless, we obviously already figured out a number of issues. Yeah? You can see we end on three dots, and these three dots will actually represent a lot of other issues. Uh, after this, we will already start. We have some time reserved uh, within this uh, panel discussion, uh, within this panel for a discussion with all of you. Um, you can already have a look at it. This is a number of issues which immediately pop up if a number of us start talking about it with years of experience, who have running projects, who have been part of the development of applications with RTI or RTI-alike uh, uh, systems. Um, one of the big issues, for example, which are from, which are fundamental issues which we have to look at from the very start is, at this moment, all of the viewing systems uh, we have are uh, WebGL-based. Yeah? So we kind of have to figure out at the start what to do with this if we would start to working in an integration. Uh, another thing for those who definitely followed uh, yesterday, the 3D workshop, also and a number of discussion points there, RTI was mentioned as, uh, as well, uh, because yeah, RTI is also a step towards understanding the 3D dimensionality of an object. So why would we here give the ID to open a working group to integrate this? If there is already is a, uh, a group who is working on 3D applications in IIIF. So this is something we have to sort out as well. For sure, I'm not hinting anyone, but this can definitely be part one of one of the discussions uh, we can have in a couple of uh, minutes. Uh, what about it? We, we kind of already think quite firmly that it is definitely not the same at all. Uh, the, the, the input data is actually two-dimensional. So from that point of view, it's very well related with the most of the current workflows we have within uh, IIIF. So we kind of think it is good to uh, approach it separately, but nonetheless, these are fundamental things we have to discuss before we really uh, go full into uh, this. And then there are a number of technical uh, uh, and dissemination issues. Obviously, whatever the technical choices we are going to make, it will have its uh, influence on the dissemination. Um, what do we actually want? Where do we want to land? Do we want to work towards uh, the low fruits first and to have already a working uh, approach as fast as possible? 
um, uh, one of the issues, for example, what Frederico also um, mentioned is that indeed there are, it's way not as complicated as the, 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 the complicated forest of the 3D world. Uh, there are a number of different approaches with this 2D plus, 2D, 2.5D or whatever. The different groups around the world who are working with this kind of technology have called it up till now. There is no standardization. But depending how the processing of your input data is, also other possibilities uh, can, be, uh, can be made possible once you go into a dissemination uh, environment, so within uh, our viewer environment. So we have to figure that out. And uh, so here today, we are launching the ID to, uh, to, to go forward with that. Uh, but these are the first things for sure we have to figure out uh, what to do, how much weight will we give to one of these issues, what will we handle as priority, and so forward, and so forth. Uh, these are a number of issues. Yeah. Um, immediately, Andy will very shortly show you that, of course, within IIIF, there is a path to follow to make sure that we can start working as a, as a, work, as a technical working group. Um, but these are issues we have to tackle, tackle of course, throughout that uh, parkour, throughout that uh, process, uh, once we really start uh, working. Andy? Yes, so one of the many possible paths through here, of course, is that we come out of today's discussion having solved the issue, uh, and then there's no further work to do. Um, but I think it's more likely that we'll have some form of community group uh, going forward that may or may not involve any technical changes, again, depending on how discussions go today. Um, we will be putting out towards the end uh, of the discussion kind of a feedback form for, for people to kind of gather interest, get together, uh, and join us on this journey, hopefully. Um, and so that it's not just us, but hopefully uh, these are kind of the potential roadmap. But again, driven entirely by what we decide to talk about. So I guess we'll start our, let's start our discussion. said you'd answer the hard questions. So. <laughs> The first one is uh, uh, this, to, to render an API, you, you, you need a, a, a WebGL format. And if you have uh, 100 uh, images, you need 100 uh, WebGL format. So you can have that. You can do 30 bits if you want to create a complete workflow of WebGL. So you have to resource very few applications to do that. There are, of course, other solutions where you can have um, you can have a video, so it's thumbnail, or uh, a collection of images that you need one from the other, so th there are some tricks. But you cannot uh, reasonably have uh, a, a thumbnail where you can interact and interact with the hundreds of thumbnails at the same time. Uh, it's a limitation of, uh, of the platform. Uh, 
certain things in the film school for me that have actually worked. Um, so it's a, it's a all, all of the stuff I just went over is available as a, a, a new bank approach and it's just a step in the right direction. So I'm very, very excited and I hope that for everyone else as well. Because I agree with what you said about the film school. Yeah, so <coughs> that's what I wanted to give to you. Good choice. Uh, no, uh, so we, uh, we sometimes have to say to ourselves 30 or 50 megapixel RPI. That's way too much for a full film school or a CPU. So we at least use a, a, a today was the last day of April. We use a multi, uh, uh, multi uh, perimeter approach, multi color perimeter approach, uh, multi resolution approach. And if you compute, for example, an ambient one out number in, in that frame of sight, you don't have to uh, integrate the full stack. It's just layer and uh, ambient and something that I can use in my work. So go to the RPI function to play back with the uh, discussed this enough. <laughs> <laughs> but it is of course it, it is of course my first answer would be is it possible to continue to work with a film system? Yeah. That would be my first answer to that. And then the other question is what is that problem? One of the, the, the main problem is uh, that you need to expand an existing tool. There are solutions for doing so. Uh, I have developed a library that is a good set of images and I have other Basically, it's a question of integrating uh, the, the existing technology within the current tool, provided that uh, they are using what we have up uh, on the Mac, and that's the, the main uh, logic issue. More and more uh, uh, tools might be moving towards Colloid RPL, and so it could not be a big problem. Uh, so I can only speak to our uh, examples, but uh, as you know, Rob, uh, we have also been replacing the first images destroyed by the bomb, and we uh, have a problem uh, in our plugin with with uh, the text we could use, and so it paints over the mirrored or uh, the mirrored option just to make it look like I actually wrote the words rather than the image that I wrote. So it's it's a that is a slightly more difficult problem. Yeah, but it works. It works really really cool. It's what we are trying to do. Necessarily uh, implement the, the the light cells with the control that we use to kind of show the the the, the light cells in the film. And that's also interesting to get into your like RPI specifically and film because like I'm that idea of like annotating. Uh, 
to, to extend to all other technologies that are being made also about tracking images at other meetings and other venues. So the, the idea is exactly the same. And to start with one example that is well known and uh, probably easy to understand globally, and uh, probably extend to the uh, other technologies. Thank you. I think what we've tried to avoid this panel discussion being is what even is RTI, given it's like actually many, many techniques. There isn't the RTI technique. Um, even on this panel, I think there's three different techniques being used, but we're all just saying it's RTI. Um, but I think we, I guess we're trying to find a balance perhaps of abstracting it enough that we're not just saying it's RTI, but not getting too abstract that we're trying to say solves all problems with data, which would then start becoming 3D as well, and, and it's, it's trying to do everything. Um, but yeah, uh, it's finding where that line is that we can be confused by the artificial to some extent, but um, it's up to two point five D. about like when you're thinking about explaining this to like a, a foreign API for instance are you thinking that it's just a common API for, for them if they can like keep track with how many appearance are on log or are you still thinking about like their specification API and then thinking about the back end if uh, in my understanding uh, the beginning of people I guess including the initial API The main reason is that this is extremely uh, we want to visualize the meeting. This is not exa exactly why we need this specification in the proper side. Uh, it's because want to, we want to keep it in mind, and they are light enough that any device available nowadays will do all the work of that transformation. So we are thinking of using the image API for delivery. the canvas to add coordinates and location and stuff like that and only define uh, to, to give enough information to the viewer so that he can uh, do the lighting transformation and encode a few of other visualization that are that are abstract because uh, uh, visualization uh, the lighting is just require a precision encoding of the image of the screen but you might want to say give me the albedo give me the geometry uh, remove the color and show only the surface or specular analysis. So to uh, organize and define a set of different viewing modes that every that you can transfer between the viewer so that when I make my viewer with the same parameters, I, ca I can trust the parameter and he will have in his viewer the same parameters and I can annotate the visualization of the object where I say, here I have specular enhancement with this topology where light comes from this angle and I, I will be able to make a pitch mark that I can transfer to another person. All these kind of operations are not exactly image, uh, uh, image API extension, but could be also an URL of some kind, so it's not exactly clear where we are, but uh, it won't be something that needs to be implemented in the server like the image API. It will be probably not the right thing to call image API. Especially an example of one of the things in Acquisition is how you figure that out as well. How do you implement the API? Yeah, do you think you could do it? I think the meeting is really important. So you have to think about it. But yeah, I think that that's the reason why some people are interested in having the same API. Some of the examples that we have are like, uh, like Google Docs, 
you very much for your for your <laughs> interesting insight on that. And uh, in, in, in a couple of minutes, we will show uh, how you can connect with this group. You can always react to them. <laughs> Any other questions? Thanks for mentioning the Anticipate um, interest needs for making reference to a later hearing back at the hearing. So RTI or Kumar like myself have done a first reading, and then we either animated or we decided and we put the pieces. So what if we wanted to see the third version of your lighting set up? Do you anticipate that kind of need and that granularity? That is the kind of question I've always been receiving for 15 years. <coughs> to have this available, there are already a number of, uh, of uh, people who kind of try to work on it, on it to, to make that possible. But this is indeed something that, that at least NGO Digital Community in Holland is very interested uh, to do for us. And I guess for the work we are uh, suggesting to do, this is something we should put on the roadmap, but does it need to be already implemented from the start as something that the architecture behind it makes it possible to easily implement on the choices we have made that could be developed in future weeks. Also in convenience to our clients and uh, questions that are always uh, raised by our clients. Yeah, that's Passover and Richard, for the example, I sort of your pick best view of the dilemma and uh, Federico, you say that uh, this would be the one that is in line with the dilemma that Chris just Depends who you ask the question. Eh? The curator, which is the kind of high mark view on your object, or a, a researcher who is interested in the detail of the, the weeds and, and that kind of content. So it's kind of extra possibilities for, for, for the ability to see some of the things. Yeah, the, the Donatello, I mean, we, we did a grid of the Um, so I just wanted to share the, the kind of the TSG process and, and kind of how it works. So um, whenever we want to change to the specification or maybe even a, an extension, uh, what we do is form a, a technical specification group, a TSG. Um, so we already have one for maps, we want to have for authentication, search, uh, and 3D. Um, so if we did want to make kind of additions to the SSS specifications, then it'd be an RTI um, TSG group. And this is a kind of a kind of process, um, but the most important thing really for this uh, session is to get a list of uh, people and institutions which would be interested in both um, talking about the RTI specifications and then uh, also be uh, kind of semi-committing to implement it afterwards because we can't really do the work unless people are kind of interested in, in implementing the, these things. Um, so once we've got the kind of list of people who are interested, um, we then have a, a draft charter, which uh, people can agree, which would set out what the um, group hopes to do. 
Uh, and then it goes through kind of various approving uh, the Triple F Coordinating Committee and also the um, TRC uh, just to get the kind of tick off. Uh, and then there's a kind of a wider call for participation and then there'll be regular meetings, um, just like the, the MAPS groups and the other groups. And then hopefully at the end of that process, uh, there may be one, there may be more than one uh, specification, either an extension uh, potentially integrated into the main body or um, just kind of various uh, aspects like that. Um, so that's the process. So I think you're kind of focusing at the moment on, on, on particip participation, if that's right. I didn't put my email address in the form because I'm paranoid about GDPR. Uh, I don't know quite if we should or not, um, but maybe if we've just got the names, that okay. No, but if we do, we we don't really need to collect everyone's email address. That's an email address. <laughs> Are you a lawyer? Do you know GDPR? <laughs> okay. Well, you decide if you want to put your email address, and <laughs> please don't sue me. <laughs> All right, and I appreciate you getting us back on time. I'm grateful for that, so we won't cut lunch short. Um, up next, uh, we have uh, a couple of different uh, variations on some of the mapping work being done um, in the AAA F space. So uh, first, we have Brian Haberberger, um, who will talk a bit on behalf of the co-chairs of the different maps groups. We have a community group and a technical specification group. Um, some of the recent updates uh, on that front. Um, and if you can mention the other chairs uh, who are involved with that, but he's speaking on behalf of, uh, of those groups. Um, and then uh, I'll just mention now, we have Bert Spann and Jules Schwimman talking about a particular project that's very exciting in the mapping space um, called All Maps. Uh, so I hope they'll follow uh, Brian directly. Uh, yes, hi, I'm Brian Hebenberger from St. Louis University. Uh, and I am going to talk to you about some of the map stuff's going on. Uh, I may be the presenter here, but the content you'll see within, you know, I had help from all our other chairs. There's Mike Appleby, Virginia Boyero, uh, Stace Maples, Bert Spahn, and Elliot Jordan, which I believe is everybody. And of course, everybody else in the MAPS group whose demos I'm going to show you today. Uh, I'm going to move quickly because I know I have 10 minutes. Uh, essentially, what uh, MAPS has worked on is to enhance the IIIF ecosystem to take on the cause of making geospatial data a primary piece of data for IIIF resources. Uh, of course, all humanities data is in some way connected with somewhere in Earth, someplace somewhere, and uh, it's, it's an extra way that we can communicate information about those resources um, that, in particular, I think can cross a lot of cultures and languages because a dot on a map is a dot on a map to all of us, and we all kind of know what that means in our own way. Uh, so when we talk about doing things on maps, uh, we could put images, audio, and video video onto maps, um, and many of them are not maps, so I, I want to make that clear. Uh, when someone takes a photo of anything, they are somewhere in the world. Whatever entity they photographed is somewhere in the world and has likely moved around for different purposes. Uh, so those are already inherent geospatial descriptors, people, and data often take for granted, even though the ability to show that information on a map is quite powerful. Uh, so here's what a resource might look like on a map. Uh, in particular, those dots represent a canvas, and that canvas has an image and has other information like uh, title and summary. And so that's what I mean by just a resource on a map. That obviously the picture of that sculpture is not a map. Uh, so we can move on to uh, the next sort of primary thing we see, which is maps on maps. Uh, and the reason that's separated out, even though an image of a map is just an image, it comes with some more of those inherent geospatial features that uh, I talked about. So, for example, if you see a map of Paris, France, just that, you know you were sculpted in the position of Paris, Paris France uh, in the world. And if you can point out the Eiffel Tower on that, you've actually pointed out the position of the Eiffel Tower on Earth. And that's what I mean by inherent geospatial descriptors. Uh, with the small caveat that not all maps are created equal. So many of the maps we encounter are things like ancient maps or uh, maps of virtual worlds, like game worlds or contrived places. Uh, and they're not drawn as direct projections of the surface of the Earth. 
uh, maps of localized surfaces and maps of extra extraterrestrial entities uh, may not even be related to that projection at all. And so showing those things in connection with Earth comes with, it, with its own set of challenges that we won't really get into today. Uh, so here's an example of a map on a map. There you see um, an inset from a pamphlet that's showing the uh, Chesapeake and Ohio Canal. And uh, what's been done there is that took that snippet from the pamphlet and actually lined it up with where it really is in the world. And so that's what I mean by a map on a map. It's a little different from the last example, which has had the dot with the information in the pop-up, because in this case, we actually sort of made uh, a, a space for that image and where it belongs and actually just drew it directly onto the map. No pop-up required. So the lines can blur. I am a gamer. Uh, in particular, I've always liked the Assassin's Creed games. And here you see uh, this person who has said, I, li I lined this up after I played the game. And so here, although the game in Assassin's Creed is not exactly uh, a direct projection of the surface of the Earth, you start to kind of blur the lines in these scenarios. And I'm sure people have experienced virtual reality where you come across situations much like this. So wh where we started uh, is um, non-destructive annotation. So you can assert resources onto a property. Uh, you can assert geospatial information onto a resource with annotation, which doesn't alter the resource in any way and doesn't even require the content owners to even know that you did it. Uh, and in that way, we can do this referencing to geospatial space without uh, destroying the original resource. So to give you an example, if it will let me, and I probably pushed a button I wasn't supposed to, did I? Okay. Uh-oh. It's all right, I got you. Okay, so I'm going to... Just, uh, what this demo is going to show you is a piece of software that I sort of got ready for the conference that lets you make one of those annotations for a resource. That was me. I got you. <laughs> if I press what? <laughs> oh, live type demos. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, it's called 3M Geolocator. Uh, so if I want to just annotate a resource... All I have to do is know the URI of the re resource. No. Oh, man. <laughs> and then say, oh, I want to use that. It'll yell at you and say, hey, that's not a real resolvable thing, but you can go ahead and keep using it. Just know we're not going to be able to do a whole lot with it. Uh, and then you'd see an interface something like this. It lets you pick a location. You say, I want to use that. Confirm those coordinates. And what this generated was a sort of GeoJSON annotation, which asserts those coordinates for that targeted resource. You would do something like hit create, and you would hope that an annotation store or something would save that and give you an ID. And then you would hope you could go and take that into a viewer and then see it. So there's the resource and the dot I just made, and, and I just geolocated. It's a real thing. It's a web annotation with an ID that's targeting that resource. Um, and sort of that's sort of like a sort of training-related way to show people how simple it is to do, even though technologies in the background might be a little complicated. <laughs> Thanks, Glenn. You're the best. <laughs> he warned me not to do lifetime demos. Probably wasn't going to do. I won't do that to you again. Okay. Uh, so I was going to go through sort of a, a uh, a slide reel of demos, um, but I think I'll just sort of say the other way to do this is to actually embed an annotation on your resource, and a lot of times we do that when we're trying to select a fragment, because you can't really do a fragment with uh, the extensions we've produced. Um, and also, IIIF does things intentionally not annotation, and actually makes properties for those resources, and those links would take you to those properties, and you'd search for something geospatial and you wouldn't find it. 
So one of our output is was to do the nav place extension, which you've heard about, which takes that GeoJSON object that you saw with the annotation, except it sort of is not an annotation, it's just the GeoJSON within that property. And in that way, you can provide uh, location to your resource directly. Uh, here's a list of implementations. I'm just gonna go, I was gonna lifetime demo them, but I'll just go through the screenshots I have. Um, so here's one out of the SFO where they publish their flight pads every day and uh, they've made them GeoJSON now for me. So I can ask for their manifests and their manifests are nav place enabled and so it shows up in the viewer. Same for something like a stroll through a mountain where you took a bunch of pictures of that mountain uh, from the mountaintops. Or the uh, consortium members list from that you saw earlier. Gwen made one for me a year or two ago so that's probably not up to date but he did make it available for me. Uh, here's from Figgy, which is from Princeton, which offers uh, the IIIF enabled content, which also shows up. Here's uh, what that might look like if you combined it with an app place, uh, with a mirror door viewer. Here's the map time demo from Mike Appleby that combined nav place and nav date. And so you can see here how that map does the same thing. Uh, these were from a couple of recipes, so if you go into the cookbook, you'll find these recipes, and if you take the manifests from those recipes, they'll show up in the viewer. Um, the geo example I showed you can also make a nav place property, so if you provide a resource, let it resolve, it'll add a nav place to it, and you can save that derivative and get an ID of your resource with a nav place property now, uh, which that one's fun, and I'm sorry I can't demo it. So sort of what came after the geolocation was georeferencing, and this is who you're gonna hear from next, the all maps group, uh, which like I explained actually, lets you place that image onto the map as the image itself. Uh, they'll go over that more in depth. So aim for more, shoot for the stars. Uh, one thing we say in these extensions is that you can't express the location of extraterrestrial entities or contrived worlds. However, the extensions we've made don't preclude the development of future extensions to address that use case. Use cases need a champion, that's the word we often use, someone to sort of shepherd it through the peer review process to publication. Uh, so if you have a use case, you can be that champion, come pitch it to Triple IF Maps. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Bert Spam. I'm here with Jules Schoonman and together we work on a project called All Maps. Uh, today we'll tell you all about it and we're also going to tell you um, about all the institutions around, around the world who are already using uh, All Maps. Um, as Josh already mentioned, uh, three weeks ago, uh, the Triple F Consortium together with the, the Maps GOG published the Dureference extension which is now an official extension to the Triple F APIs, and it allows you to place uh, images in a geospatial uh, world, so you can um, warp a map and then overlay it on other maps. Um, it's a web annotation, and I can show you how it works. Um, the most important thing, of course, is linking it to the, a Triple F resource. This can be a Triple F image or a canvas. Um, you can also select a portion of the image that you're interested in or remove non-cartographic material. Let's say there's, you have an image with a legend on it and you want to remove the legend and just focus on the cartographic part. Or sometimes there's more maps in a single image, like inset maps. And then the most important part is linking uh, resource coordinates to geospatial coordinates. So you in the annotation, you supply a list of, of those pairs of points, uh, called ground contour points, so you can see here, there's resource coordinates, mostly th those, are, those are pixels, and then that line coordinates. Um, and with those annotations, we can start now placing all of those millions of triple F uh, maps that already are available um, in a geospatial world and start warping them and georeferencing them, overlaying them. And those images that you see are just a few examples from uh, institutions around the world who are already, uh, yeah, uh, publishing their map collections through Tripaf. Um, just some more examples, this is a map of a road, a road atlas of, uh, of Italy from the 1950s. Map of Naples uh, from, the, from 1815, from U Utrecht University. Uh, another map of Pompeii 
was op een uitweg. Another map of Pompeii uh, from Boston. Um, and the ins interesting things about those Pompeii maps is that you can see the different uh, periods of time in the excavations. Another Pompeii map from 1890 from the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. Um, and uh, Jules and I are working on a project called All Maps, which is an open source project, which is funded by grants and partnerships. Um, and it will allow you to, to create those annotations, those reference annotations, and then start doing interesting things with them, like overlaying them and working on them. Um, and the great thing about all maps is that you do not need a complicated GIS infrastructure. You don't need map tiles, you don't need geotips, you don't need map server, you don't need geo server, you don't need QGIS. It all runs just in the browser. Um, so it works. Uh, we have a few applications that you can use. Uh, first of all is the all maps editor, which you can use to georeference your five images. Then we have an annotation server called the OMAPS API. Then a viewer application, which you can use to, uh, in the browser, uh, work and, and overlay maps. And we're also working on plugin for Leaflet um, and open layers, as well as tools to allow you to export um, maps to other map formats. This is a short movie of how this works. This is a map of the Library of Congress of Venice. Um, so you go to our website, you can use any drop I have image uh, from other institutions too. And somewhere, hopefully, there's a link to the TripHop manifest. You click on it, you copy the URL, and you go to All Maps Editor, which is editor.allmaps.org. You paste, <laughs> this is a very slow movie. <laughs> you click load, and then you can see the image, uh, and yeah, the image exactly, then you can mask or crop um, the, uh, the image, so that's it's effectively, effect yeah, so you're creating the SVG selector can be a simple rectangle, but also more complex shapes. So you, you don't want the inset map, you don't want the actual title, and then we're done. And then of course, the most important part is georeferencing the image. Um, all of us know where Venice is, at least I do, it's over there. <laughs> you can see the S-shaped canal, which I don't know the name. Um, click a few times. Usually, uh, when the map is not too old, uh, Facing three pointer points is more than enough. Um, this is a very quick view reference, so maybe not too precise, but that's fine. Um, and then this application produces a view reference annotation, which you can open, save on your own computer, um, or save or store in our annotation server. And there you go. Uh, the map is warped and overlaid on, in this case, OpenStreetMap in the browser using WebGL. Um, you can do things like opacity. Uh, start comparing uh, this map with OpenStreetMap or also with other historical maps if you want to. And this is the annotation, um, which is the, the what I just showed you. So pointer points and a mask. Um, we are working with the, uh, the, uh, the Boston Public Library and their map center. This is an uh, example of one of their atlases. Uh, all maps can also stitch multiple warped images together to create a, a single uh, view of what you can see the individual uh, top of images here in like a pink outline um, you can zoom in and it's it always is loading the the the, the triple f the parts of the triple image that it needs in the right resolution so it's not never downloading too many pixels and you can also do things like automatically removing backgrounds <coughs> so you can start comparing in this case what buildings are still there in boston this is a suburb of Bo of boston um this is all those maps of Pompeii that I just showed you. So if you just overlay them together, it's not, doesn't, it's not too useful. Um, but we're working on tools that you can uh, remove the background and then give each layer a different color. So you can start doing comparisons like this, uh, where the history of the ex excavations um, start making sense if you compare the, the different historical maps. Um, and like I said, people are already using all maps. Um, there is more than 23,000 uh, georeference maps already available in our uh, annotation server. Um, it's quite a lot. Uh, we have a website called latest.allmaps.org where you can see what map, pe uh, what map people are georeferencing. This is updated live. Um, and we're working with the Boston Public Library, like I said, and they're using all maps in their georeference, crowdsourced georeferencing project. Um, now uh, I'll hand it over to Jules. So in this part of the presentation, we'd like to show you uh, some examples of people already using all maps. 
So we distinguish between the use cases of curators of map collections, so often digitized researchers who are using maps as primary source material, or students who both study and design maps. Uh, first institutions, you might think that georeferencing is something new, but it actually has been around for a while, and many institutions sit on a lot of data, old data, of georeference maps, and they would like to convert this to uh, georeference annotations. This is the example of Leiden University Libraries. In 2013, they took over the management of a large collection of colonial maps from the Royal Tropical Institute, and a significant part of the collection was already digitized and has been added to their digital collections and can be accessed uh, through IIIF. So what we did with them, uh, well, they also inherited uh, an Excel sheet with uh, the bounding boxes of the uh, of the different maps, and what we help them do is to convert this to georeference annotations. And as you can see, is that this old data that was lying around is all of a sudden very useful. Uh, it does contain uh, mistakes, uh, as I think you'll see in the next one. Uh, but you know, uh, this is could be a good basis for for improvement, and it already makes the collection much more accessible. Uh, next example is the uh, Leventhal Map and Education Center at the Boston Public Library. They're an early adopter of all maps and have sponsored the development of some of our tools. They've used MapArpor in the past, and uh, this can no longer be supported due to outdated uh, dependencies. So what we did is we uh, converted uh, exports from MapArpor uh, to georeference annotations, and these will become available uh, on their website. They also use a tool called Atlascope to present atlases of the uh, urban region of Boston. And um, here you see a guide, that, uh, guide, actually an internal guide, but they published it publicly uh, for how to uh, work with all maps uh, to dereference these atlases. Uh, an interesting guide also to replicate for other institutions. And uh, they've, they've made custom scripts to add it to their Atlas Scope uh, application uh, where they still use uh, GeoTIFFs. And this shows you how you, know, you can sort of take the bits and pieces that you need of all maps uh, and integrate it into existing workflows. Second group of researchers. Um, so setting up a GIS infrastructure for a research project can be very challenging, and maintenance of often not guaranteed after a funding period ends. If, however, the source, source material is available to tr through IIIF, all maps abolishes the need for setting up custom databases uh, with derivatives. And georeference annotations can also be a great way to share back to the uh, original institutions. So this is uh, SODUCO, it's a French uh, research project, and they study the urban evolution of Paris uh, in relation to the professional practices of the Parisian population. The two main sources for the project are municipal atlases from the French Revolution up to the mid 20th century and uh, trade directories where you can see uh, professionals and where they were located. The project aims to extract information from these sources and to validate and connect them. So a lot of their source material is already available in IIIF repositories, in this case, uh, the Atlas Fernique from Gallica in the David Ramsey map collection. And they therefore, did therefore uh, converted uh, QGIS data to georeference annotations, and they published this as open data, which is great for those uh, institutions. And it's moving. And this is Paris in year one, that's the revolutionary, revolutionary calendar. Um, we should be zooming into the Opera Gagné, but I will skip to the next slide. Uh, they also set up a proxy server for uh, institutions that do not yet uh, support IIIF, also to convince them <laughs> that they should. Um, and um, um, what is great, but uh, I'll, I'll skip this because it's running slow, is that you can always shift in the all maps viewer between the georeference map and the original image where there's usually a lot of interesting information uh, on the borders of the image. They're also working on image segmentation. This could be used, for example, to uh, automatically generate masks for images. Open historical map is another use case. They uh, are using the ID editor of um, uh, OpenStreetMap and uh, they would like in that editor to be able to, yeah, we're running, uh, to be able to add uh, all maps as, as all maps map layers, but they cannot do this directly. So we made for them a proxy a server, an XYZ tile server, which allows them to uh, add all maps maps as layers. It's not, it's not going very far, is it? 
well, you'll get the link at the end and then you can look at it yourself. So last, the category of students uh, using all maps. Um, we are very fortunate to have a multi-year collaboration with the Berlach Center for Advanced Studies in Architecture and Urban Design, TU Delft. And last semester, the uh, students worked on a collection of river maps of the Dutch uh, river landscape, and they de-referenced that at the beginning of the course. They also used a tool called Placemark, and we collaborated with uh, the developer uh, to annotate those maps. It also uses the XYZ tile surfer, and they could actually annotate it with additional information. Interesting, you could also convert these annotations back to uh, web annotations uh, as part of the manifest. The course ended in a, well, they actually started to making their own sort of uh, imaginative histories of, of certain places, and it ended with a physical exhibition, but we also made with them a, a website presenting their work as a good example of storytelling, and you can go visit it at riveratlas.deberlage.nl uh, and look at some of these slideshows uh, since the, the, uh, the video is not running at the moment. This, this application is also open source. And then I'll go back to Beth. <laughs> well, this is just one feature that we're currently uh, uh, working on. Uh, this is a new transformation algorithm uh, which warps the map slightly differently. It really takes each control point as a fact, as a true fact, so it really pins it to that place, and it is a more advanced way to, uh, to, to transform the image. And uh, this particular image, uh, this particular map, I should say, we have here as a present for somebody who really helped us uh, with the, you know, finishing this georeference annotation and who really guided us through the process. So Brian, please come forth, and uh, we'd like to hand you over a little gift. <laughs> 